Welcome to the first week of June and hopefully the start of your summer. I'm Alan Arnold and you're listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. Now, I hope each month you've been receiving the Ransomed Heart newsletter. These are amazing writings from John about kingdom related topics. And we have one out every month. The previous month has been on union with God. And so we wanted to partner our podcast on that same theme. So what you're about to hear is part one of a two-part series we originally aired in February of 2017 called Union with God. And Union with God is so important because it's really the epicenter of our Christian life. Oneness with God is the goal. And so in this first of the two-part series, John explores how can we overcome what gets in the way as we cultivate a deep and growing union with God. Here's John. To get us into the conversation today, I want to read from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Jesus is praying to his Father, but he's doing it publicly, audibly, so that it would be recorded, so that down through time, we would have the benefit of listening in on Jesus and his Father, listening in to what Jesus was praying for, particularly as he was about to pass the mission on to the church, particularly as the events were changing from the incarnational presence of Christ in Palestine to um, the presence of the risen and ascended Christ in, in all of our lives and the global experience of Jesus. So, here's what he says. He's praying and he says, Father, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. And then a little later in verse 20, he carries on, my prayer is not just for the believers who are right here with me. I pray for all those who will believe in me through their message. So, this is everyone, all Christians, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This this is an extraordinary description of the essence of the Christian life. This is this is the epicenter right here. This is the core of what Christ knew in his experience on earth and what he's praying that we would have an ongoing experiential reality of. And, and it's oneness, union with God. Now, I know this passage often gets used for church unity because Jesus does say the words, I pray for all those who believe in me that all of them may be one. But that's the first part of a sentence. He goes on to describe what he means by that. And it's not, you know, ecclesiastical unity. He says, just as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, so he's talking about union with God, may they also be in us. And then he goes on to describe it again in verse 23, I in them and you in me. So, Jesus is describing something here that as you delve into this, as you explore the realities of it, is just going to blow your mind. He's talking about oneness of being, a, a unity of being with God. Jesus earlier in the Gospels, um, part of what gets him crucified is he says, I and the Father are one. So, there's a a union that we can understand between Jesus and the Father, right? God is one. 
they are so intimate and so thoroughly a part of their exchanged being, they are one. They have a oneness, a union. And this is what Jesus is praying for us. In fact, what's what's extraordinary is he, he adds the phrase complete union. May they be brought to complete union with us. Again, not, not union in the body of Christ, although that's a good thing. Not church unity. That's not what he's describing here. He's, he's using his own union with God, the Father, to describe the union um, that he's praying for us. And the phrase that he uses here is complete union or perfectly one perfectly united with me. And, and as you begin to unpack this and, and kind of chase this down, look at different scriptures on it, you realize that this is the epicenter of all of the other things that you want in your life with God, that, that you want, period, in your life. Like, I think the number one reason that Christians experiencing a higher level of restoration or victory over their struggles or guidance, direction, the fulfilling of their purpose, their calling, the realization of dreams, you know, on and on. The number one reason is they're not approaching those things out of union with God. I forget who started the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It's a rather startling phrase, but what it's trying to say is, look, this isn't just about being a good person. This isn't just about believing in God. I think that there are millions of believers that are trying hard, but are not finding the power to live life as they want to live, the, the power for their sexual integrity, the power to get their anger under control, the power to avoid, you know, all those food and, and chemical addictions, the, just the power to be able to be around incredibly abrasive people and still be a decent human being yourself. Like, the problem is, is that they're looking at the Christian life as, well, I want to obey, or I want to trust God, or I want to hear from Him and do what He says, and, and those things are all good. Um, but that's actually not the essence of the Christian life. The Christian life is not essentially a set of beliefs that we attach our life to and then try and live live them out. The, the epicenter is actual union with God. And, of course, a couple chapters earlier in John 15, Jesus gives the famous example of vine and branch. And the, the whole point he was trying to make is you know, the, the branch is fruitful, the branch has life, the branch has energy, it has power to produce all kinds of goodness, leaves, and then blossoms, and then from the blossoms, fruit, because it's united to the vine. But as soon as you disconnect that branch from the vine, like, it's not going to go well for that branch. It's going to dry up. And I think for me, one of the most dramatic examples of this is the healing of the sick. What Christian is, doesn't have the longing for their prayers to, to bring healing for their loved ones or just the suffering in the world? You know, we would long to see a greater expression of the healing of the sick and the power to, that that would do to be a witness to Christ. My goodness, like, what would that do for your family and your extended family if they actually saw the healing power of God? It's so irrefutable, you know, and um, what would that do for people's hope and their faith? I think it's very apparent that no one's going to bring about healing on their own power. I think we all get that. Like, I can't just walk in the room and lay my hands on someone and they get well out of my own power. We, we understand that healing takes place because God is there. Healing takes place because His power comes into the person. And, and the whole point of laying on of hands is, you know, we become a, a vessel of the power of God into the sick person. And it's just a clear example of <laughs> nobody's pretending that's going to happen because we did it. Like, it's only going to happen because God is there. And so, we're talking about the essential nature of the Christian experience is finding that your 
actual life, your being, your existence is developing a deeper and deeper union with the actual life, being, and existence of Jesus Christ and God our Father. I was reading in Oswald Chambers, and and he says, the salvation which comes from God means being completely delivered from the self-life, the independent life, and here's the important phrase, and being placed into perfect union with him. Okay, so the, the goal is perfect union. That's right out of John 17, completely one, <laughs> okay? Not tangentially one, not occasionally one, not circumstantially one, but completely one. And Paul unpacks this powerfully in Romans 6, 7, and 8 when he talks about being united with Christ in his death, united with him in his resurrection. And, and then in Romans 7, he says, you died with Christ so that you may be joined to him. You died to the law so that you may be united to Christ. And um, in 1 Corinthians 6, where he's talking about our sexuality in particular, and he's saying, man, don't unite yourself to a prostitute or, or a sexually trafficked person. Don't unite yourself to anyone sexually outside the marriage covenant. And then the rest of the sentence, he says, but the one who unites himself to the Lord is one with him, one spirit with him. So, he's using even a, a sexual intimacy, like, like real union, to talk about our union with Christ. The goal is union. And I think what I just want to ask as I begin to unpack this and, and give some direction for this is, is that our orientation? Like, do we wake up in the morning to say, the first thing I need today is union with God? That the primary thing I need is union with God. In other words, are we organizing our day to secure and sustain union with Jesus? Because I know, you know, we some people get up and they have a quiet time. Other people get up and, you know, um, start reading the news. Um, others get up at the last possible minute and don't even get a bite to eat. They just grab their coffee and head straight into their day. Whatever we're doing, it reveals what we're after. And are we organizing our day? Is this our basic intention? Is this the, is this the one thing that we're making sure we are cultivating and operating from? Or is this really kind of um, tangential, uh, it's for the elite, it's not even a category I'm thinking in. So, what I want to talk a little bit about is the practice of it. Like, how do we cultivate union of being with Jesus? We want everything that I am, all of my capacities, body, soul, and spirit, heart, mind, and will, and everything I am to be growing in a deeper and deeper union with God. Because out of that is going to flow everything else that we've been hoping for, you know, the, the freedom from our addictions and the power to bring Christ into situations and the clarity of guidance and mission, the, oh gosh, just the integrity of being, the holiness that we want, the freedom from the rage and the jealousy, all of that, all those other things are the fruit of life that is increasingly one with God um, through Jesus Christ. So, let's just talk about um, what gets in the way, and then I'll talk about what a, what a practical approach to this looks like. The Scripture gives an unholy trinity as the primary operating system against our lives in God, and it's, it's the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, James says that's the unholy trinity. Those three things are the kind of the structural alliance <laughs> against everything that's, that's of God and his kingdom in the world. The world by which he's not referring to waterfalls and hummingbirds. He's not talking about the natural world. He's talking about the world that 
fallen man has created um, that has an energy to it, a pace to it, a value system to it, a culture to it, that is set against the soul. Uh, he names our own flesh, um, which is one of the scripture's descriptions. It doesn't mean your physical body. Various points in history, the church has really misinterpreted that and thought that the body was evil. Actually, your body is called the temple of the Holy Spirit. The body's not evil. What he means by the flesh is the self-life, the, the sin nature, that part in us that inherited from Adam and Eve original sin, that inclination to simply do life in opposition to God or apart from God or, or just simply without a thought of God. So, you have the world systems, culture, values, pace, priorities, and then you have the internal inclinations that are not in harmony with with God, and and then you have the enemy, and they use different means to try and prevent or erode our union with Christ. So, let's unpack just an example of how each of those assault or diminish, try and prevent or try and erode what we're after, which is a deeper union of life and being and existence with the source of life, with God. I think the world's primary assault on the soul and on our union with God is simply pace. There are assumptions by which um, different cultures operate, but particularly in highly developed nations, you know, where kind of the Apple um, logo is everywhere, where technology rules the day, uh, the assumption is you're going to run at the pace of the world. You are going to maintain, you have to. I mean, if you, if you want to keep your job, if you want to have the competitive edge, if, if you want to just keep up with soccer and music lessons and school programs and church programs and email and text and all the things that are going on, you have to run at an insane pace. And what that conveniently does, why that's diabolical, is that it cuts off your union with God. You, you have absolutely no time to cultivate a deeper union with Him. And I, I'm not just referring to, oh, I need to pray more, or, oh, I need to have a quiet time. Those things are helpful if those things are in the service of union with God. But if those are just more activities, they actually end up wearing you out. So, you know, the, the world gets us on a, on a hamster wheel, and we find it very, very difficult to get off. In, f- in fact, if you try and get off the hamster wheel, y- you will be seen as a freak. Y- you, will, you will be so bizarre to your friends, family, neighbors, coworkers. And, and unfortunately, this pace thing has infected a good part of Christendom. And, you know, you'll hear... Uh, missionaries um, bragging about, you know, uh, I traveled 200,000 miles last year, and it's horrible, actually, the the pace that we have let infect our lives. And it's costly to change it. Let's just be honest. It's It's going to cost, but there's simply no way you can operate in a deep and growing union with God, which is the source of your life, and keep up with the culture around you, keep up with the pace. And that would just be one example of the world. I think another example is the barrage of content. I was reading somewhere recently, uh, it was in The Economist magazine, that an article that um, next to sleeping and our actual occupation, you know, the things we have to do for our job every day, the third most you know highly performed activity by human beings right now is watching video content you know the youtube and and the stuff on your phone and all that that it's just insane that we are barraged by content and the human soul can't keep up with that that's not that's not how we were meant 
to learn. That's not how we were meant to grow. Um, and it it so keeps us rattled um, versus rooted that you can't cultivate union with God when when you're just constantly barraged with input. So, those would be examples of the way in which the world is assaulting, and and the obvious application is, well, if you want to fight that enemy, you're going to have to begin to detach yourself from the ways of the world and be willing, frankly, to pay the price. Now, the truth is, um, (laughs) as soon as you begin to experience union with God, you're going to realize it's totally worth the price, and and actually you end up being a a much healthier and and productive human being, and you actually have a a better marriage than your neighbors, and you you have better health and a better life than the people at work, and you actually end up being a radiant human being. So, you know, in the beginning, it, you kind of experience more of the cost side of it. But as you practice this, you realize, oh my gosh, like the world is mad. It's utterly mad. And the Wendell Berry quote is, uh, to be sane in a mad time is hard on the brain, worse on the heart. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's worth it because you you can cultivate the the existence, the life source, the the perfect union, our flesh. And again, I know it's you know what we typically think is we think in in sin categories, you know, oh that's my that's my sexual stuff or or that's my you know alcohol thing, and and it is those things, but. But beneath that stuff, on a far more operational basis, kind of the more common expression of the flesh, it is just our assumed independence of God. We just live independently. We we shoot up a few prayers and go into our day. We we don't pray at all for weeks. We we don't check in. We just have this natural ingrained insistence in doing life on our own terms. And the flesh does not like to be interfered with, which is what that whole sacrifice thing was about, by the way. And it's it's also, I think, it's what's at the heart of tithing as another example. Tithing is not some huge expression of whether or not you're you're a follower of God. It's just a quick and easy cut straight to the quick of does God get to say what you do with your money or do you? <laughs> like it's so abrasive. It's just so irritating. It just cuts straight to this to the chase of of kind of our standard operating assumptions, this learned independence. And anytime God intrudes into our lives, you know, the first thing he encounters is this stubborn resistance to to do life on his terms. That's the flesh. And then yes, of course, it expresses itself in, you know all kinds of, you know, bizarre ways, um, controlling uh, rage, anger, addictions. But, you know, go back to the Old Testament story of the people of Israel leaving Egypt. So, you know, this phenomenal rescue of their entire race has just taken place, and they're following God now um, to the promised land, and there's a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night through which he's guiding them. But the story is hysterical because the cloud or the fire stops and starts at totally unpredictable and random times. Like, they'll go three days, and then they'll stop three weeks. And then they'll go a day, and then they'll stop a month. And then they'll go and go and go and go and go and not stop. And it looks capricious. (laughs) It looks sporadic. God knows exactly what he's doing. He is cutting to the chase of that human thing of, I want to do it my way on my terms. And so, it's just a beautiful story of, will you follow me? Will you let me lead? However disrupted this may be. The other way that the flesh gets into the way of of union with God, I, I think, is where we turn for life just where we turn for comfort, where we turn for solace, where we turn for a little something. I mean, you get home at the end of the day and you're fried. What's your natural tendency? What do you do with your fried? Uh, Very few of us make the intentional practice of, oh, when I get in the door at night, uh, the first thing I do is turn on worship and sit down and just let go of my entire day 
and rediscover my union with God. <laughs> Some of us do. But most of us head to the refrigerator, we open a bottle of wine, we turn on the television, you know, you know what your stuff is. Like, we distract, we medicate, we anesthetize, we, you know, and the reason that gets in the way of union with God is that you're seeking your life outside of Him, the things that bring you life are not primarily God and his kingdom. And so, the world, the flesh, and then the enemy. And the enemy will, uh, it really is an unholy trinity because the three work together in cahoots with one another. Enemy attacks our intimacy with Christ in every way he can, often through accusation, uh, you aren't in union with Christ. He's far away. It's one of his favorite ones. You're far away. It's another one of his favorite ones, making us feel um, disqualified from a life united to God. And then just the assaults that come in that cloud our perception of the living God. Like Paul says, in our Father, we live and move and have our being. Like, God is literally the reality all around us. But very few people perceive that. Very few people actually perceive the presence of the living God with them, in their car, in their office, you know, as they lie down at night. They just, and the enemy's just fogging, veiling, clouding, you know, kind of what we'll call shell shock or fog of war. You have all the specific attacks, but mostly it's just a numbness to the presence of God. And the good news is, friends, um, those three things are fairly easily dismantled, actually. If you will say to yourself, you know what, I know that what I need is union, it is an actual sustaining united being with God. I know I need that. I need his life in me. I need his love in me. I need his power flowing through me. I need his mercy and his comfort. I, I, I need an actual bonding with God. I know I need that. Then you can begin to make some pretty simple choices to organize your day and your week uh, where you can turn the world out you can crucify the flesh. You can shut the enemy down. Friends, I hate to stop here, but we need to. The truth is, this is so important, and it's so dense, it's so thick, that we just need to pause, let that sink in, think about that, and take this up in our next podcast with part two. You've been listening to the Ransom Heart Podcast with John Eldridge talking about union with God, talking about Jesus' prayer that we be perfectly one in our being with Him, with the living God. <laughs>